Hello there, welcome to Showcase. Nothing compares to you, singer Sinead O'Connor has died at the age of 56. Fans and fellow musicians are devastated by the news. O'Connor will be remembered for her powerful vocals and controversial career. Tribute messages for Sinead O'Connor poured in on social media platforms. English singer Tim Burgess wrote, Sinead was the true embodiment of a punk spirit. She didn't compromise and that made her life more of a struggle, hoping that she has found peace. And American rapper Ice-T said, Respect to Sinead, she stood for something, unlike most people, rest easy. American rock band Garbage's message included these lines, This disgusting world broke her and kept on breaking her. Thank you for all the beauty and all the wise teachings you offered up to us. The Irish singer was born in Dublin in 1966. She had a troubled childhood and was placed in a Roman Catholic asylum at the age of 15. This is where her writing and musical skills thrived, but it was also an experience she called traumatic. In the mid-1980s, O'Connor formed a band called Tan Tan Makut. Her work then caught the attention of the music industry. She released her debut album, The Lion and the Cobra, in 1987 as a solo artist. And though it received critical acclaim, it was her second album, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, that carried her to stardom. Since you've been gone, I can do whatever I want. Her version of Singer Prince's Nothing Compares to You became a worldwide hit in 1990. Her shaved head, pained expression and shapeless wardrobe in her music video was a direct challenge to popular culture's long prevailing notions of femininity and sexuality. About this, O'Connor would say that it was a response to record executives pressuring her to be conventionally glamorous. Sinead O'Connor was definitely one of the most complex pop and rock stars, uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe of all time, certainly the last couple of decades. She's someone who, uh, on one hand, was an actual genuine star, you know, both in her, her look, her voice, everything about her, yet she was clearly so conflicted about it. She, she clearly had some mental health issues that she grappled with on and off for decades. Her political and cultural stances and troubled private life often overshadowed her music. From backing the Irish Republican Army to ripping up a photo of Pope John Paul II during a television appearance, she's been in the thick of multiple controversies. And in 1994, she took a six-year break from releasing new music. It made me go back, really. I, I um... You know, I suppose it's tied in with the reason I left it for a while. Um, I found it a little hard to carry the weight of, you know, prejudice that existed really about me, you know. Um, but then after a while, my friends and my family began to say to me, well, you know, I shouldn't really let that uh, stop me from being creative in, in some way. In 2018, O'Connor announced she had converted to Islam from Catholicism. She changed her name to Shuhada Sadakat, though continued to perform under her birth name. I wanna make but O'Connor was always clear about not ever having a desire for fame. She once said that as an artist, she wanted to force a conversation where there was a need for one. Well, at that, she definitely succeeded. Show you. We're all used to seeing sculptures of mythical figures or privileged elites of the past in museums and galleries. But a British contemporary artist creates works that celebrate ordinary black people. And they are now on display next to historic masterpieces at London's v &A. These sculptures don't show any leaders or Greek goddesses. Instead, they're just people you might come across on the street. And it's all thanks to Thomas J. Price. The British sculptor celebrates ordinary black people, 
and his pieces now disrupt the traditional displays at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. When I was at art school, the works here are a lot of the works that I was referencing in terms of, you know, what we are told is, is uh, powerful or what we're told is prestigious and, and not seeing anybody look like myself in, in amongst these people, I think kind of, kind of came along with me on my journey in terms of exploring our value systems in, in the United Kingdom and, and beyond. So it's, it's, it's quite an incredible experience to see the works kind of put up against in contrast to, to the sculptures here. And, and sort of, and the power that they have, you know, when they're sitting alongside them. While the faces and poses of the statues look familiar, none of them are based on a specific person. They are composites of different faces and bodies, inspired by Britain's black community, often drawn up digitally before Price commits them to clay and bronze. So, you know, these works are fictional characters. You know, so they're already critiquing this idea of portraiture, this idea that a singular individual's narrative is so important that it elevates them above everybody else. Curator of the exhibit says Price's work shows how much more democratic sculpture has become compared to the yesteryears. His work is not about aggrandizing individuals, it's not about portraiture, it's about the everyday person, it's about all of us. And in this, it's, it's just work that makes you feel um, valued and respected and heard and seen. And what I really hope is that everyone going through these galleries will feel like this. The exhibit, which is part of a wider effort for a more diverse art world, runs until May 2024. French director François Truffaut championed two things through his art, literature and cinema. In his Fire Night 451, he emphasized the importance of books in a world where they were burned. And as Alijan explains in our movie Aminak, with Day for Night, he brings out the human connection in making movies for the masses. Un tournage de film, ça ressemble exactement au trajet d'une diligence au Far West. D'abord, on espère faire un beau voyage, et puis très vite, on en vient à se demander si on arrivera à destination. Day for Night is the story of a director who tries to make a picture while solving practical problems and managing his cast and crew. In the hands of director François Truffaut, this storyline about a trade becomes a love letter to cinema. The hardships faced when working on a set are portrayed with humor. The family-like atmosphere of the experience is also shown with care. The film acts like a documentary in that we see retakes being shot, actors needing attention. And all of this has to be solved by the director of the movie. Attention, moteur! But Day for Night also approaches filmmaking from a personal standpoint. Spending time on a movie set for a long period of time brings people together. That sense of camaraderie is what Truffaut captures through a complex set of relationships. And that brings out the human connection in cinema. Truffaut was the original movie buff turned director. And it's no wonder that Day for Night is such a passionate depiction of his day job. Like-minded film critics got the message. Roger Ebert called it the best movie about movies. Gene Siskel added that it's a wonderfully tender story of fragile, funny and tough people who populate the film business. 
Day for Night may be 50 years old, but it still holds sway over today's global film scene. One of the most acclaimed contemporary auteurs, Wes Anderson is a fan and even paid tribute to it in a commercial he directed for American Express. And what makes Day for Night endure is that quality of touching other people who share the same passion about cinema. Rwanda's Obomonte Arts Festival is described as not just a meeting point for artists, but also a motion filled by hope. The collaborative nature of the festival honors diversity while underlining art's ability to bring people together. Ubumuntu Arts Festival has been committed to using art as a vehicle for expression and creativity since it began in 2015. And under the theme, Believe, Faith Over Fear, the festival's ninth edition featured curated music, theater, and dance performances, providing a platform for artists to use their talents for positive change. Ubumuntu Festival is very important for, for our art community because it's a place where it brings all, everyone together as a unity is a place where we can come together, we can heal, we can talk, we can share, but at the same time, we can have our own voices. So we can have our unique voices and visions throughout this festival. So it's, it has been very, it's, it has a huge impact on the art community. Art is for everyone. So it's a very important and strong tool for social transformation for community getting together and helping each other to, to develop, to evolve, to heal and to be. The festival takes place annually after the 100-day remembrance of the 1994 Tutsi genocide ends. The three-day event at the Kigali Genocide Memorial Site's amphitheater displayed rich cultural legacy. Guests had the chance to observe art and challenge traditional thinking. The most impressive thing for me this year's festival has been the growth, the amount of growth in terms of productions, in terms of artists' engagement in values of humanity, because this festival is about arts and humanity. And just seeing how artists, are, uh, the, the, the moral courage of artists trying to you know, embrace the aspect of humanity, regardless of the kind of hard situations they're going through or the recovery from COVID-19. The festival encourages visitors to become part of the change by creating an environment where faith succeeds over fear and hope prevails in the face of adversity. It seems comic book heroes have taken a vacation and instead films related to toy lines are keeping cinemas busy. The latest addition to this trend looks at a phenomenon that took a hold on kids back in the 1990s. You want to sell high-end stuffed Himalayan cats? Understuffed, actually, for a greater possibility. We're professionals. We're giving the people what they need. The beanie bubble is about a toy salesman who, along with three women, comes up with the next big thing for children, the plush beanie babies. The movie investigates how and why they became so popular for a while. And that's a question even the toy salesman can't quite figure out. Ty would tell you he did it all. Which is as crazy as believing stuffed animals are gold. Alongside with Barbie, the beanie bubble has now become another flick to focus on toys. This has always been my company. Company we created together. Why do you have to be so dramatic? I mean... My salary's been reduced 75%. ReadySteadyCut.com says it takes advantage of consumers' nostalgia for product-based movies. But whereas Barbie is a satire, this one adopts a different approach. 99% presentation. That's not how the saying goes. 
Rather than using figurines, it provides a glimpse behind the scenes of toy sales. In that sense, it's closer to the video game-related Tetris, which looks at how that game left Russia to become an international hit. But the Beanie Bubble's examination of the corporate mentality also ties in with Barbie's themes. Partners lined up. If it's any consolation, everyone knows you're the one really running the show. From a toy-to-screen angle, it seems companies outside of Marvel can now go and raid their own vaults to come up with cinematic retellings. And that could mean an even bigger swell for the wave of toy-related movies. But can this trend pose serious competition for comic book adaptations? Only if these films can achieve similar blockbusting box office figures. As for the Beanie Bubble, its story essentially tells audiences that toys are serious business, made up of quite a lot of dollar signs. You're dead to me! I only want to speak to Oprah. Winfrey, has she reached out? Superman may be DC Entertainment's flagship hero, but let's face it, the Kryptonian's recent cinematic outings weren't deemed worthy of his powers. However, his latest small screen adventures seem to be winning over the fans. And that might have something to do with the producers reintroducing the qualities of a much different genre to the world of superheroes. Just call me... Superman! I'd like to interview you for the Daily Planet. Uh, sorry, no comment. Uh, gotta go, gotta go take care of that blimp. Oh, come on! My Adventures with Superman finds the man with red and blue coming to Earth, befriending Jimmy Olsen, and eventually falling in love with Louis Lane. As you can see, with this new series, the famous citizen of Krypton is getting yet another reboot. Everyone thinks they know the Man of Steel. Never seen the son of Jarrell like this before. Who am I? But where the movie adaptations of the enduring comic book failed, this recent incarnation is getting good word of mouth. Reviews call this Superman charming, with the bumbling heart of a classic. Who is Superman? Lois, I know what Superman is. Huh? You think he's a plane? <laughs> it kind of looks like a bird. It's not just soups either. Other characters are also well developed. Superman! That's why critics believe the show brings a breath of fresh air to the franchise. The reason behind the praise has something to do with DC going back to the roots. This Superman is not about explosions and pulverizing major cities. It's character-driven, and there's humor. About... About... Warner Media executives say they went back to Christopher Reeve's Superman from 1978. Lois! Where's Clark? I thought he was with you. What do you mean? He's right here. The light-hearted flick influenced the romantic comedy tone in this one. If you remember, in addition to saving our planet, Reeves Clark Kent also tried to win Lewis Lane's heart. Uh, I'd say, hold on. Uh, and that dynamic produced the rom-com feel. The press says My Adventures is a modern take on all that. Is this how you see the world? It's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. And these qualities, all combined, make this Superman coat the most heartfelt and human representation of Clark Kent to date. And for a character that's been around for 85 years, that's saying a lot. Filmmakers who rather blow up cities in their own Superman movies might like to take notice. Clark, you're all right. I'm so sorry I didn't tell you my plan to interview Superman. I put you in danger because of it, and I... It's okay, Lois. I know how important this is for you. 
And I promise, from here on out, I'll do whatever I can to help you get that interview. Actually, I just got it. Wow! You got the interview! The Bolshoi Ballet has been subject to a cultural boycott since Russia's attack on Ukraine. And now it's just returned to international touring. The first stop is the country's top ally, China. But how many more stops will there even be? Let's find out. Moscow's state-owned Bolshoi Ballet took the stage in Beijing as part of its first international tour since the pandemic. Although the company toured the world even during the tensest days of the Cold War, that's not the case nowadays, as Russia's war on Ukraine has interrupted its shows. Of course, unfortunately, we no longer have the same open borders we had in the past. But at the same time, it is amazing that we are in China today. And the company only has two further confirmed international stops so far, Minsk in November and Oman in January next year. Many governments have banned cultural figures from Russia. They are just governments who pass those laws. But we are still talking to the same people we talked to in the past. Those who used to be my friends in France, the US, Italy and Germany are still my friends. In February 2022, the day after Moscow sent thousands of troops into Ukraine, London's Royal Opera House called off the Bolshoi's planned post-pandemic return that year. Cancellations in other Western cities soon followed, and creative collaboration with Western venues and choreographers evaporated. I hope that we will still be in touch with foreign choreographers in the future, even though I have enough work as it is. But I would certainly like to know and learn something more, something new. But it is what it is right now. Russia's attack on Ukraine has caused an estimated 8,500 civilian casualties, according to the UN. And although the conflict continues, Vaziev believes when it comes to culture, everything will return to how it should be. Because for him, culture is a wave that is very hard to suppress. The metaverse will not just change how we see art in the future, but even what we consider to be a work of art. That's according to a former director of the prestigious Venice Biennale. Here's more. Does the future of art lie in the metaverse? Some digital artists say virtual reality, augmented reality and artificial intelligence are already changing the art world. It's not just the world of um, exhibitions and institutions. I guess the very notion of what an art piece can be will change. Daniel Beerbaum runs Acute Art, a London-based digital media artist collaboration platform. He says the technology could revolutionise the world of exhibitions. I mean, someone asked, will, will uh, you know, VR be in museums? And then I had to provoke this person and say, well, maybe museums will be in VR. And I think it's, you know, curatorially, it, it will, you know, what is an exhibition? How do you exhibit these things? What's an institution? I mean, in a way, when you do augmented reality that you can place outside, you can place it in the city and, and you can create dialogues with monuments or architecture with the city, you don't even need the museum, you don't need the biennial, you don't need a, the classical art fair. You can do it with the, you know, without anyone, actually. Virtual reality creates brand new worlds or environments normally viewed through a headset while augmented reality inserts artistic creations into existing worlds and can be viewed on a screen or a device. Acute Art and London's prestigious Royal College of Art are teaming up with some of the biggest names in the world of digital art to explore the changes and possibilities in a new short course. I'm not saying that this is going to replace the, the, you know, the physical experience of an art exhibition, but it is, uh, you know, it, democratizing, yes, because not everyone lives in London or Berlin or Paris or smaller capitals in Europe where there are big collections and, and art schools and all of that. In principle, this is a possibility to reach audiences anywhere where there's, uh, where there's, an in, where there's internet connection.
That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esra Drust from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.